Thanks be to God. It is with great joy that I am able to announce to you that in the next few Sundays here in the season of Easter, the lessons are featuring my favorite books. That's always dangerous because my favorite books in the Bible change from time to time. But honestly, the epistles of John, not John of the Gospel, they're two different Johns, written at the very end of the first century, 100 AD, scholars believe, are some of the most heartwarming, life-transforming words I've ever read or heard in my life, and I love them. I remember as a confirmand, I wanted to have the very verse we have today appointed, and Lynn Hoger got that one instead of me. <laughs> well, that's okay, I got Ephesians too. You know, that great Lutheran one, <laughs> the great Lutheran one. Uh, no, this is a powerful, potent, and I, I'm hoping that you will read it every day this week. Take it home and read this. Now, we have 1 John for three Sundays in a row. That's how important the lectionary people thought this was. And it's all about love. <laughs> the most important attribute anybody can talk about in terms of God. You know, there are all these pictures in the Bible of God. God is a rock. God is a king. God is mercy. God is grace. God is light. But the most important one is God is love. A very special kind of love. Not a mushy, sentimental, half-baked love, but a love that goes to the deepest realities of our everyday life. And that's what's happening in the epistles of John, and also in John's gospel, the other John, is that they're trying to make the case for this life being wonderful and worthy in all its humanness, in all its bodiliness of being redeemed and loved. And there's a reason why they're doing this. And I'll get to that in a minute. But, uh, no, uh, there are all these pictures, and some of them are better than others, and we have love in the New Testament. That's the premier image of all other images. God is love for the whole world. No exceptions. Um, or as it says, I love this in our epistle lesson today, um, God is love, and those who abide in love abide in God. Did you know that you abide in God? There's this marvelous symbiotic relationship between God and human beings, and we rarely feature it, and we should. There's a fancy word for that, and uh, I won't use it here. It's, it's for a, a Bible study. But it's a huge word that says God is not just transcendent and out there and out of reach. There's something about God we don't know. Let's be humble. But that's not all. God is imminent close to us, loves us, can't stand to be away from us, and that's why God sends Jesus to personify this deep love. All right, now here's why uh, this, these authors are so keen to talk about loving right where we are, even our bodies. We forget that sometimes. Uh, at the time that... Um, First John was written. It was at 180, as I told you. That's 60 some years after Jesus' life, teachings, healings, death, and resurrection. Do you know what can happen in 60 years? <laughs> Lots of change. Look at me <laughs> in 60 years. I mean, I had hair at one time and so forth. Uh, no, and, and in institutions things change because people learn new things and they talk about things in different ways and some people don't like that can't we just get back to the old you know and there's something good about the old but there's something good about also evolving but sometimes the evolving is not so good and in this case it wasn't okay there's this thing called Gnosticism at the time that this passage was written and both in the Jewish synagogue and in the early fledgling church, John's church, there were people who were called Gnostics. Some of you know that word. It's from Gnosis, knowledge. 
and knowledge, head knowledge, was keen for these people. It was number one. It was above love. And the, and the author of First John knew it, and he was going to take them to task. He did it in a very gentle way, and very subtle, by the way. But this is the reason that the epistles were written. And John, the gospel writer, which was written just 10 years earlier, still 50-some years after Jesus' life and death and resurrection, he also takes it to task in very subtle ways in his gospel. Like when he reports Jesus saying, I am the vine. That's some ethereal thing way up there. I am the vine, just like you see right out your front door. You are the branches. There's something organic about God's love. And my nourish, uh, nourishment comes through the vine into you. You know, Jesus was always talking about natural things. He was doing things that healed people's bodies. The Gnostics would have nothing to do with it. They hated the body. They did. This was their uh, theology. They loved the mind and the spirit and everything ethereal. But when it comes to bodies, they're rather nasty, aren't they? I mean... I won't go into it, but there's a lot of bodily functions, and the Gnostics wanted to rise above that. Do you know some people like that? I do. Don't name them. Um, they despise the bodily nature of our life. And this happened in the Jewish synagogue, where the first Christians gathered until they split. They had a different idea of who the Messiah was than the Jews, and that was a natural split. And uh, it also happened in the church. And thank God there were people who said, what is it with these Gnostics? We are going to the orphans and the widows' houses. We're bringing the Eucharist to the ones who can't get out because their bodies are important, despite what you guys say. But the Gnostics said, well, we're, and they divided, see. We don't have anything to do with the body. It's all about the thinking and the ethereal and the spiritual in fact, they said, not only does the world contain some evil, it is completely evil, and our job is to get out of the earth. You know, there are Christians today who see Christianity as an off-ramp to heaven, <laughs> and it has nothing to do with this, with this world. They're still Gnostics. I don't call them that, but I think that when I hear them. Um, but no, Jesus loves people. Jesus loves the earth. Jesus loves nature. Jesus loves bodies. He healed them. It was important to him, see? Um, but yeah, the, the, the Gnostics said, well, you know, it wasn't the real God that even made the world. It was a satanic God, a demiurge, they called it. And that's why the world is so awful, and our job is to get off this earth. Why bother with the widows and orphans? They have a little cold, too bad, you know. They can't get out, too bad. They ought to be like us. The problem was their knowledge was this elitist knowledge only for those who were smart enough. It's all baloney from the, from the perspective of the early church that did all kinds of things to honor the body. Okay. Two white-haired men met at the Tokyo airport. They hadn't seen each other in 40 years. One was an American sergeant named Ponich, Eli Ponich. The other was a Japanese sniper, Ishbashi Akira. The last time they had met was in a cave in Okinawa, World War II. Sergeant Ponich had ordered his amphibian crew to bring him to the beach in perfect sight of this cave where he knew there were Japanese people who were hurt. He said, get out of the boat, lift up your rifles, and put them on the ground. In contradistinction to his American orders, by the way. Put them on the ground. He knew the Japanese were watching. He goes into the cave, and Ishbashi and one other sniper is in the cave with him, hiding. But he didn't know that. And he finds a five-year-old boy who had been shot in the legs, bleeding, crying in his own puddle of blood, up in the thighs, and he goes to this little boy and comforts him. And suddenly he's aware that there is someone behind him 
with a rifle. You know how that happens sometimes? You can be aware of someone's presence. He turns around, and Ishbashi has a bead on his head with a rifle. And <laughs> this is amazing. Panich turns his back to the sniper and picks up the little boy and lifts him up and kisses him, puts him down, all with his back to the sniper, takes out his canteen and begins washing the wounds of this child. At this point, Ishbashi lowers his rifle. And then Ishbashi will never forget what happened next. Panich, Sergeant Panich lifts the child up, turns to the sniper who no longer has a rifle bead on him and bows to him and carries the boy out and brings him to the field hospital. They never knew each other's name. How did they meet? You're wondering. I'll tell you. Uh, by the way, neither one told their families, as many World War II uh, veterans didn't. My father didn't tell us anything about the war. Many veterans don't do that. There's a reason for that. They kept it a secret, but they never forgot, see? And Panich, 40 years later, decides he's going to thank the Japanese people for raising up a man who understood love. See where I'm getting? Love from the vine. And he sends an article to the newspaper in Tokyo. Ishbashi reads it. He goes, I'll bet I'm the one he's talking about. And he arranges with the paper's assistants a meeting at the Tokyo airport. <clears throat> he's waiting in the wings, whatever the... I was going to say the narthex of the airport. <laughs> I've been in church too long. <laughs> whatever, that, whatever that opened. And he recognizes in his own heart that must be Ishbashi. And Ishbashi, for some reason, and they had stared at each other for quite a time in the cave, he figures this must be the guy, that American, that bowed to me, see? And they approach each other gingerly, never taking their eyes off each other. And then the tears start to flow. See? Why? They recognize in each other the very love of God that does not look if someone is worthy of any sort of bodily care or not, just does it. You see? And then they embraced. And then they laughed. And then they spent the rest of the day getting caught up on history. Now their hair is white. It was jet black when they were in the cave. 68 years old, both of them. Um, by the way, you can look this up, and I encourage you to do it as a continuation of Sunday's liturgy in your own devotions. Add it to whatever you're doing. Um, yeah. I tell you this story because uh, not only it's a perfect story that our lessons are talking about, but it also talks about the ripple effect, yes, of love once done. There is a ripple effect. I mean, all kinds of people read this article, right? And this is partly how we get the love of God out there, by sharing what has happened. Oh, what our lessons, lest you wonder, does this fit the lessons? Oh. Beloved, let us love one another. This is the first John 4, second lesson today. Let us love one another because love is from God. That's why we do it. You don't have to feel warm about every loving deed you do. You do it because love is from God. And everyone who loves is born of God. Notice everyone. That means Ishbashi, Panich. Everyone who loves is already born of God and knows God. And by the way, in the Greek, knows is a very powerful word. It isn't just, I kind of know him. It means you know God. When you know love, you know God, is what John is saying. And God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent God's only son into the world so that we might live through him. Both Panich and Ishbashi were living through Christ. Whether they at that moment thought about it or not, this is the cosmic Christ. This is the cosmic story. It happens. God chooses to bring God's love through wherever God wants to. That's the notion of God. God gets to do it, see? And God loves it because God loves, as St. Augustine said, what God makes, God loves, and what God loves, God redeems because God feels it's worth it. 
Every physical act of love, which you folks do by the bucketful, every one of those is redeeming and transforming the world. It's not a small story. It's a big story, see? If we love one another, God lives in us. I mean, it just keeps going. And, and, and it is very daring and bold and outrageous statement is next. If we love one another, God not only lives in us, but his love is perfected in us. Really, the word is completed. It doesn't have to be perfect. It's completed. And by this, we know that we abide in him because he's given us his spirit. I mean, this has got all three of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, see? It's a marvelous text to keep on reading during the week. Um, and we have seen and testify that God has sent God's Son. Love has been perfected among us that we may have boldness. Remember at the forum I was talking about Luther's phrase, sin boldly? We may have boldness in continuing to love because as he was in this world, so are we. Well, I, I, I want you to look up that story. Seriously, I can't tell you. You must. But I think you should. Uh, just go to the Internet. You all do it. And take uh, 15 minutes this week and just type in Eli Ponich or Sergeant Eli Ponich. And Ishbashi will come up and you'll have that story. So um, in your baptism, you know why we spend time talking about baptism? Did you remember that you were transferred from one reality to another? You were, according to St. Paul. When you were baptized, the Spirit entered you and brought you into the way of unconditional love, despite what the world says. And despite how awful we might think the world is, you've been baptized to be a part of the redeeming of the world, or as St. Paul says, your partners in the transformation of this world. It's huge. It's absolutely huge. Um, finally, remember this. Christ is your new reality. And in this reality, as you heard from the story, there are no people of greater value and no people of lesser value. This is a stronghold Christian doctrine. There's a new community, the community of love. And this community gets in on the wonder of God's very earthly love, and it both learns and partakes of Christ, not only in the hearing of the word, but in the Eucharist, the Holy Eucharist, where once again we receive the presence of this boundless love in the form of a little bread and a little wine or grape juice. You are already his branch. You don't have to wonder, am I, a, am I one of the branches? What do I have to do to get to be a branch? You don't do anything. It's all gift, see? You're in. And you're bearing fruit. Not just the fruit that I see, but there's fruit that is born in you that no one sees but God. Jesus reminds us that in his Gospels. You are Christ's hands, cuts, Christ's eyes, his tears, his smiles, his heart, his compassion. That's how it works. Yesterday's gone. Tomorrow's not yet come. Live joyfully in the vine. Amen.